What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode. Today, I have Swire, and we talk about a lot of things. The conversation goes through chambers of commerce, networking, growing, selling his business, all kinds of good stuff. And honestly, I think you're going to really, really dig this conversation. I know I personally did. And um, no joke, I was looking at my paper. I took notes. I'm like, man, I wanna, I'm going to need to do that in my business. So if I know if I'm taking away information, I know you will too. Let's check, out, check it out and see what he has to say. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of the Gu Yao Now Show. I am, of course, your host, Bob McIntosh, and today I am joined by Swire, the hashtag, the promo guy, as it uh, shows if you're watching the video. If you're not watching the video and you're listening, well, now you know. Um, but I'm excited to converse with him. I know he's had a huge background in selling a business, starting more, and really just growth. I'm interested to see where this conversation goes. I think he has a wealth of knowledge. We were talking right before this, just this man, like just the way that he was talking and speaking about the things he was speaking about, I can tell he's got an insane amount of knowledge in there so i'm gonna try to pull as much as i can out for each of you listening i'm excited for for all of you to be joining in on this episode uh swire thank you for being here i appreciate it man thank you bob thank you for having me on on, on your show so for everyone who doesn't know you which i'm going to imagine is the majority of my audience um tell us a little bit about who you are what you do and sort of your journey to get to where you are now uh, my name is Swire. Uh, the name of my company is Garuda Promo. People also call me the promo guy. As the name would say, uh, I'm a promotional product consultant. Our philosophy, uh, you know, being in our industry, people, people think about promotional product. They call it Swire. You know, stand for stuff we all get, uh, stuff everyone gets. And our idea is actually different. You know, we ask a lot of why uh, to our client. You know, why are you buying this? Why are you doing that? And then in a way, we wanted to try to help people to make a lasting impression in front of their client and try to help uh, using the product that we have to help them build a loyalty for the following. And the ultimate goal that we wanted to do is help a brand to build their client into a mini advocates for the brand. So something that they will stand by, you know, something that they will promote and engage with other people that they know uh, on behalf of your brand without you paying them. Perfect. And so let me ask you this, what, what kind of made you get into the, the promo game? Like what, what, why did you decide that, that path to follow? That's an interesting story. I think no one really like study for it and want to, I want to grow up to be in the promotional product industry. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, I, yeah, I, I want to be a national. I want to be, a, I want to be the promo guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I um, have a previous business uh, before we were in CD, DVD replication business. So we uh, manufacture uh, CD and DVD. So we work with a lot of uh, record label, film companies. So along the way, when they go on tour, they said, do you guys do t-shirts, do hats that we can sell? Or when they do a red carpet, can you do the gift bags with a logo on it? I said, yes. So we kind of got into that industry. And in 2000, like every good entrepreneur, right? Yeah, yeah, I can do that yeah. for sure. We'll yeah, figure it like, out. <laughs> and then you figure out, you know, in the back end, what what the next to be done. So we saw the streaming uh, industry coming along. That's when Netflix is getting big and Apple iTunes is, you know, booming. Then we sold the business, and then we figure out what can we do. And we looked at the promotional product industry. I think, you know, this is something that will probably never go away, and there are always going to be people who want to put their logo on an item and then they wanted to be proud and promote it. So that's how we somehow got into that industry. Okay. And so let me ask you this, what did it take for you, you know, to, from, from the mindset of, Hey, I'm going to sell this business. Cause I assume that you had some, you didn't just build a business for the sake of building it. Like there, there was a, there was like an emotional attachment for you to building that and then maybe parting ways with it. Or maybe there wasn't, maybe you're like, Hey, so I'm curious a little bit more if you dive into selling the, the CD, the CD, and DVD rep, uh, replication business, like, was there an emotional in impact of that? You know, how to like, or, or did you just say, hey, it was a pure business, I see it coming, we're done, we're out of here, we're moving on to something else? Well, we we had, you know, built up to a good business, but then we really see the trend that, you know, internet connection at that time is getting faster. We do see that streaming is getting better. Even though we are, you know, good with our level, uh, we know that at some point, you know, the, the self of physical uh, media is going to decline. So we were lucky enough that, you know, a local competitor always want to find out what we had, what we're up to. So we, uh, there was a good match. So we sold the company to the competitor. So it was, you know, uh, you know, hindsight, it was a good move uh, in 2013. You know, 
<laughs> Definitely. So, sounds like it for sure. Okay. So all right, you, you start over or maybe not start over, but you start this promotional business, which you kind of already implemented into what you were doing in, in some capacity. Um, you know, were you able to carry over a lot of the customers you had or did you have to go find new ones or how did that work? In the beginning, we found out that, you know, straight in promotional product is very competitive because, you know, we have a lot of people in the entertainment industry and that industry is like the most competitive. You know, they mm -hmm. are so big. You know, if you want to work with a record label, 20 other competitor wants to work with them. So we kind of have to pivot a little bit and then look at, you know, with the industry and the product that we sell, who else will will be a good client. So we always look at that, you know, whatever the product or, um, you know, trending item that we have, who might be a buyer? Because if I have the best item that I think uh, that I have available, if you're not a buyer or if you can't afford what I'm selling, then there's no deal. So we looked at what it is that, you know, people, who, my consideration is who has the most budget, who might never go out of business, and then who has large uh, needs for a product. The answer I find out that is the government. We found out that local and state agency and even uh, federal government, they buy a lot of promotional product to promote. Hmm. Essentially, they will never go out of business, right? <laughs> They'll just print more money to pay you. It's fun. Yeah, they, they might pay you later. You know, there might be a lot of paperwork, but we found that they are solid base client. And then, you know, getting deeper too, uh, we found out that, you know, uh, if People looking, you know, I'm, I'm Asian. So there are actually certification that they have that could make me separate than our competitor. So we are a certified small business, minority business, women-owned business, and also disadvantaged business enterprise. What that certification means is when you have like a federal contract. For example, we have worked with uh, the Army for the Army T-shirts. So they will actually see who have the certification. So let's say there are 100 companies that are capable on doing the t-shirt project. So, but they will look at first who had the certification that we are required to have per year. And then they filter out, even if you're a company a hundred times bigger than I do, but once I have the certification, they were able to narrow down to three company, you know, two mm. others are consulting company who don't even be in that industry, just have the certification. Then we became the only company that are able to do that job with a certification. So that's how we able to navigate through and find, I would say, a, a usual way to to do business, you know, starting with the governments. So let me ask you that. It, when you were thinking about approaching government, was there like a hesitation, like, oh man, that's going to be a lot of work? Because, you know, like I, we always hear, you know, and I'm going to say from my own personal experience, I've never, never worked with, uh, you know, government outside of inspections with real estate or things like that, right? So when you're going to approach the government, like, was there a mindset shift for you that, hey, we can tackle this for them? You know, was it an intense process that you had to go through? Like, I, I'd be curious to know more about that. Yeah, in the beginning, you got to be ready with the documents that you have, you know, be sure that okay. you have all your text return ready, or your uh, documents license ready, because they ask for all of it. You know, they even when we certify, uh, they actually send an agent to our office to actually make sure that we are who we say we are. Mm. So that process, you got to be ready for it. There's going to be tons of paperwork. Uh, a lot of people who send you to a lot of different departments who say it's not in my department to do. So prepare for going through a lot of paperwork. But then my thinking is, if it's so, I will use the word difficult to do business with them. Chances are a lot of my competitor already would given up because you have to, uh, the certification process took us six months and we have all our documents ready. So it's not an easy process just to get through to be certified and as a vendor. And then whenever that they want to buy, even for a simple item, you're counting on looking at 50 pages of purchase agreement before mm -hmm. you can actually uh, work with them. So I think it's good and bad, you know, if nice, if you know how to navigate through them already, uh, and it's kind of challenging when you first looked at it, so many documents, so many departments, so many acronyms that they like to use. And <laughs> the <laughs> government, their acronyms, there's always yeah. a ton of those. But then if you speak their acronyms and if you play by the rules that they engage in, then, and you become good at it to uh, kind of swim with them, then they like you because they know that you know where to send the billing, you know the acronym, you fill all the checkbox that they have. And then, you know, 
that's I would like to say when you work with a corporate buyer, you know, the 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 last thing they want to do is they find a new vendor and then the vendor didn't perform well. They, so they didn't like to do that. If you could perform and they like you, not even for government, for any business that you work with, uh, they will lean on the vendor as much as they can because you no, know, they they can perform. They could, you know, assume that you know they send out the purchase order, you can deliver. Uh, so I, you know, make sure that I honor it. You know, whenever and whatever that I say I'm going to do, I do it right and I do it on time. So how how did you? What was the mindset going into this? When you know there's going to be a lot of paperwork, you're starting to see that it's happening. You know, it's like it takes six months. What <clears throat> what would you attribute to your success in not giving up through that process when most of your competitors probably would have? Like how I would do in in terms of uh, a regular client. You know, the challenging part uh, for starting a new business is you have to build up your client base. They people always wanted to know who you have worked with what kind of project you have worked with. And, you know, when we first, uh, when we were able to make our first initial uh, orders from the government, I used that as my example. You know, these are the uh, company, the agency that we work with, here's the scope of work, and here's how we perform. You know, always try to ask for a testimonial. If you do something right, don't be afraid to ask your client for a testimonial. You know, you could be, it'll be, if they're willing, Video is the best, right? Get them on camera. Uh, a written testimonial is good. And even if they send you a quick email, say, you know, we, you did a good job, we're happy, then I would use those to compile uh, as, you know, what we know as a portfolio. So I would tell my new potential client, he's our, in the government, they call it capability statement. We build out our capability statement, showing them who we work for, uh, what our, you know, clients are, and then what we can do and certification that we had. And then we use all the, again, all the acronyms that they like to use. And then once they see that one sheets, they know right away that, you know, we are familiar with their process. And then, you know, they are more interested in talking with us. You know, it's just like when we do a podcast, Bob, you know, when a guest submit a uh, pre-sheets of who they are. They have a nice picture, uh, topics that they can discuss, and then what question you can ask them. Then you know that this guest is ready, right? Compared to someone that's, hey, I want to be on your podcast, you know, talk to me. Right, right, right. So, but what about that first time, the very first contract? You've got, you know, you've got nothing in your background to say, look, I've worked with these other government agencies before. So that very first one, you know, when you thought about going after that, was there like hesitation? Was there fear? Was there, um, you know, and, and like as you're going through that process, is there like, man, maybe this is not worth it? And if there was, if any of those those thoughts happened, how did you work through them? This actually is a very interesting point. Government, actually, most state governments and agencies are not able to fulfill their quota. You know, they're so depending on where you are in the country, you know, their uh, your state and local agency have a certain uh initiative to do more business with small, small business, right? But sometimes mm -hmm. they couldn't find and locate small business who are certified. So they actually have their internal agency who help coach and mentor small business like us to set up and do small business with them. So it's actually, I'm getting free mentor and advice of how to do business with them. So they'll say, these are you know, your portfolio, the capability statement, that's how you build it. You know, the, here's our the certification that you need. They actually coach me and match me up with the agency for my first one. Oh, uh, nice. They wanted to set, people don't know that. And that, uh, you don't pay for any of it. It's, you know, government resources. Even better. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not, we're not paying for it per se. We're paying for it, you know, through our taxes, right. but you know, but either way, no, that's good. That's good to know for businesses. So you, so you had someone else kind of helping you through that process. So, and so if I could summarize what you basically just said is, Hey, I had an external resource to work me through. And I think that's something that a lot of people need to think about, right? Especially when new business owners start, whether it be approaching a government contract or whether it be approaching any business or any contract for that matter, you know, can, who, who can you rely on for coaching, supporting, uh, supporting, uh, supporting roles and mentoring throughout your process? But you want good advice, right? You know, you don't just want to, to speak to anyone who is willing, you know, with the Facebook group and forums that we, we hang on to, people will give you any advice that you're looking for. But with the uh, resources that I have available, they actually, you know, for example, we uh, do uh, business with Metro. 
in our in Los Angeles. So they actually have workshops, say how to do uh, business with Metro. They actually have people from their purchasing department with there answer any question that you have. They actually have training program and seminar who teach you how to do that. So be open mind, you know, be ready, ask questions and take notes. And it didn't happen the first time. And, you know, that it's just like learning something new. You got to practice. You got to ask questions. You know, there are going to be mistakes that you're going to make along the way. Uh, but then, you know, we keep at it. So uh, after we certify, it's another six months until we get the first order from the government. Mm. Interesting. So, so you had almost a year in this entire process from the time you said, I'm going to do this to the time that the first order was placed. Um, I assume during that, uh, during that time, you were obviously working other angles of building your business, correct? Mm -hmm. And Well, I, I like to consider myself, and I also joke around to people, I'm the modern day's Marco, Marco Polo. You know, what <laughs> that means is, you know, he was a merchant from Europe who traveled all the way to, to the Great Khan and bring them things that they have not seen before. And then I say, if we are both in a business, I'll put him out of business because our turnaround is faster. And then our the items that we have available is more than them. So my idea and approach is always is, uh, can I show them something that they have not seen before? And then if I show them that they can use and impress their client. So I always look at that angle. If I'm showing you something that could benefit you and help you grow, then you know you get bigger and then hopefully my order for, uh, with you is going to get better and larger. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that. The modern day Marco Polo. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I also feel like that's, that's someone like just as a complete side note, like no one ever talks about Marco Polo, right? Like there's always like these people from our, from our, our past as humans that we talk about, but he's like one of those like footnotes that we learn about in school, but then we never talk about him again. I feel like until until this conversation that we're having right now. <laughs> because, you know, I, I, it's kind of, I'm a curious person by nature. So I look for what I call mismatch. So for example, what I find out, it was about good 10, 15 years ago. I know that, you know, kids around that time, they want to dress like a trucker. Remember the trucker head, they dress mm, like, yeah, a, yeah. They're like mechanics. But then I looked at mechanics, they dress like that every day. So by what we uh, you know, can help a mechanic shop to uh, for the employee's uniform. Now I could send the whole thing, all the, uh, from top to bottom to a tech company. I, I say, I can help you dress like a trucker, you know, put your logo <laughs> on it. So all the workers, employees on your company can look hip at the time. So would you like that idea? So this, they're welcome because, you know, they might pay thousands of dollars trying to dress like a trucker, but then trucker, just roll out like that every single day. So by knowing that mismatch and they're trying to do uh, just like a trucker, then I actually open the door. They're willing to talk to me instead of say, you know, I have stuff. What do you want to buy? That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that. How do you go about finding those mismatches? Like, is there a process that you have? Do you ask the right, like, is there specific questions that you're looking for? Or what's, what's the process for that for you? I like to focus around my interests. So obviously we all have different hobbies and interests that I like. I'm big on fitness and wellness. So I will obviously by, uh, you know, hanging out on forums, you know, doing the sports myself, I can see what the fitness industry likes to trend towards or what kind of gadgets or what kind of clothing that they have, which will translate to sometime, uh, you know, companies will ask me, we want to get an outdoor jacket you know, what do you have available? Instead of showing them the catalog to say, this is, you know, look at it, right? Pick something. Then I tell them, you know, this is a rain uh, resistant jacket. This is an insulator jacket. This is a jacket when you go to the mountains. This is a jacket when you're trying to roll out uh, on the urban street. So they appreciate that I already have the knowledge in, in those items. So I go in as an expert that give them advice instead of a vendor that are trying to sell them products. That's perfect. I love that, that you go in as an expert that's offering advice, not just a vendor selling products. And that's a huge thing. I think people approach that, like you're trying to say, what What do you need? Let me show you what I can do to fill that need versus just here's what I can do. You figure out where you best fit in my business. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. And I, I like to ask my client too, when they you know want to work with us is 
who do you really want to target? You know, tell me more about who they are. You know, uh, what kind of demographics, maybe income level, or uh, you know, what kind of hobbies do you think that they have? And then I kind of dive in on behalf of my client to study. Uh, what their client will respond to, because you know what an item that will respond to you and I are not going to respond with other people in other demographics. So uh, I would challenge them to give me as much details as they can, because the more that you can give me, kind of like when you do a Google Ads, you you want just to target anyone, then you're paying a lot of money. But then if you tell them these are the people that I want to target, these are their where they will hang out. Uh, then, you know, if the ads show up at the right time, people click on it and you convert them. Same as promotional product. If I'm giving you something that you can wait to throw it away, then I'm helping you to create landfill. But if I send you something that you really connect with, then with the, we all a journalist and reporter with our cell phone. So then the idea is, you know, turn you in, oh, this is so great, so smart, and so for me. And then you snap a picture and post it on all your social media platform. And then as a company, as a marketer, then you are able to reach a lot more client knowing really what they really respond to. That's perfect. That's perfect. So you're you're kind of, you know, in a way you're too, you're also helping them bridge the gap between physical and digital um, to create basically success in both, which is cool. I think it's we should consider another tools in marketing. Uh, obviously, you know you know the sales funnel, and you probably know the seven touches of marketing. Depending on who you talk to and what kind of service they offer, the seven touches changes. But I would strongly suggest people to consider promotional product at one of the touches. You know, through the marketing process. You know, are they maybe you are selling something that it's a higher price tag? They might not be making the decision, decision to buy right away. But along the way, you know, with the product that you send them that is relevant to them, they'll keep it and they'll use it, you know, maybe in some way. And when they are ready to make that purchase, you know, they see the product that they are using every day, then the only company that can think of is you. Interesting. So let me ask you this, because I would imagine, as you mentioned before, you know, there's obviously a lot of competitors in the space that do promotional items. Um, how have you overcome, you know, I'll say price objections of, oh, I'm just looking for the guy who's got the cheapest pens or the cheapest, you know, whatever it is that you're talking about? Well, I, I would willing and I am, you know, at the point that I would actually encourage them, you know, to if you wanted to go for the bottom price possible. And then if you're comfortable with the artwork and logo that you have and you, you know exactly what you need, there are e-commerce competitors out there that are able to deliver it. But then from dealing with client, I know that at least 90% of them don't know where their logos are. They have never saved their logo. And they, you know, as you know, when you're doing design, uh, when you ask people for the logo, Oh, just grab something from my email signature. But then what are you trying to do? <laughs> I'm trying to print something really big. And you know that the format is not ready. So uh, there's always going to be pen holding. And sometimes it, it's funny that uh, we always keep the client's logo and we also uh, get in touch with what they're trying to do. And when the client hire a new designer, they actually have them contact me to ask me to send them back all the versions of their logo because they know we kept everything. And sometimes, you know, I'll remind a client, uh, because I've looked at the branding guy, say, you know, uh, just want to point out that the color of item that you pick and the things that you want to do are not in your style guy. Do you really want it to do that? So I think going back to what I, what we like to want position ourselves, we want to be positioned as an advisor. If you want a, a vendor, I'll be happy to recommend you to uh, other uh people that are able to help you better. So I think what I wanted to do is I find out along the way that not everyone will be your client. And I am come to the point that I will accept that, you know, because before I want to hold on to, I want everyone who call me to be my client, but you can't really do that. You know, you could probably do that, but at a cost, right? So I, whenever that they mentioned price, I dropped my price. And obviously at some point they were agreed to it. But then I wanted to really target in my ideal client. And I understand that I am expensive. I am worth with the advice and the service that we provide. And there are people who value that. 
you know, when, you know, for example, you know, in your view, would people want the cheapest website they would find or people wanted the best website that they can afford? Not saying that they would pay for the most expensive website, but most people would pay for the best website that their money can afford. You know, that's how we wanted to position. You know, we are not the cheapest, we're not the most expensive, but then obviously if you want the ideas, you want the creative and you want the thinking, uh, you know, we happy to provide the ideas for you. Perfect. And I think that's, that's huge. And I love what you said that you're an advisor to their business. You're not just there to provide a product or a service and say, look, here's this thing, um, you know, go away now. You're saying, look, I, I'm, I'm here to make sure that you're getting the best that you want, that your mission's on point, that everything that you're doing is aligned with what I'm here to help you with. And I think that's a huge thing that a lot of folks overlook in business. They, they simply come in and, and I'm going to say, especially new business owners, um, they come in thinking, oh, and, and I, I love that you said, like, I used to want to have have all the customers. And I realized, no, I don't want some of them. And look, there's definitely been like, I know in our business, there's been some people I'm like, yeah, I, I know you have the money. I know you can afford what you're, what we're doing. We just don't want to work with you because you're just not aligned with either our vision or our mission or our, our set of values that we, that we, um, we encompass in our company. And, and I think that that's a huge thing. So I, I love that. Um, and, and let me ask you this. So when, you know, when you take on this advisor role, because something that I could see happening for some people, oops, as I drop my, my stuff, uh, something that I see happening for some people, uh, they could be like, oh, I have to be this advisor. And they start giving more and more and more time into a company that might create, you know, scope creep outside of the services they offer or even outside the advice that they're really qualified to give. Have you found that has happened for you? And if so, how have you kind of reined it back in? It's, it's interesting you bring up that point. So I'm an avid networker. Before COVID, I attend a lot of in-person Chamber of Commerce meeting. I'm ambassador for two different Chamber of Commerce. So I leave and breathe networking. So the idea I want to try to get is, and I like to develop what I call referral partners. And then, and I like to also develop power partners. Going back to your point, if I am asked something that is outside of my expertise, uh, then I will already know a partner that I work with, who I know and trust and develop a relationship in the chamber or from networking that I will uh, refer to them. And they're my, actually my partner. We all have and can help a mutual client, but we are not in competing industry. So I have a group of partners that I work with. So whenever that the needs are, for example, uh, you know, I'm doing a podcast and sometimes people ask me, do you do a podcast? You know, right now I don't, but I know podcast producers in my network, networking base, where I, I can reach out to. So I know that when they work with podcast producer, uh, and then when they want to develop merchandise, I know right away that they will send it back. So going back to your point, uh, I do want people to call me, even if I can't answer it, they know that I know enough people in my networking base that I can refer them uh, to the person that they're looking for. Perfect. So you, you play the ultimate connector. Hey, I'm, I have a lot of answers, but for those that I don't, I know the right person that does have the answer. Yeah. I, I love, you know, I would rather them to call me than not to call me, you know, and I would be as helpful and to put a lot of goodwill, you know, in, into the partner that I trust and want to work with. And, and so I, I want to point out something, cause I, I think what you just said is really powerful and I want to make sure everyone says that. So you approach every conversation, every client that you have a connection with, every, every you know network person that you network with, with a, an attitude of service. And this is something that I was taught early on by one of my mentors. He's like, whenever you're talking to a client, to a customer, to whatever, he's like, I want you to put your arm out like this and imagine you're like a waiter with a napkin draped over it or a server with a napkin draped over it saying, what can I do for you right now? And just what you said right there is, I think is the ultimate of that, right? It's like, hey, I'd rather you call me and I'll find the right answer for you, then don't and maybe find the wrong person, get connected with in, uh, someone that you shouldn't have or get the wrong answer, which is the worst case scenario. Or, or having seen, you know, and experienced what they're trying to do, you know, for example, a customer will have a, let's say a beauty product, they want to do, you know, promotional product down the line. But I know that when they need to, uh, you know, market the product, they probably uh, need companies in public relation. They might need a company to help them design a nice looking logo. Uh, then I will refer them to partner that I trust. So then I know that if I can help them make that happen, then eventually, you know, once they can launch their product, they'll use my service. Because if they were not able to launch the product, 
then I don't have a job. <laughs> Uh, so that's such a good point. I love that. And look, uh, one thing I, I want to state right now, and I know I've said this for all of you listening or watching to you know watching this this show right now, even if you're not in the promotional products game, which I would imagine most, if not all of you who are watching listening to this, are probably not in that space. What can you take away? How can you operate your business in the same way? The knowledge that that Swire is giving right now is applicable to every business that I know of. Um, there's not a single business that couldn't benefit from this. So even though he might be in a very specific vertical or niche, what can you take away from what he's doing that you could apply to what you're doing? So I want you to... to to, to, I, I, I like saying that just because sometimes we get caught up in saying, oh, you know, I'm not in that business, so it doesn't matter. But this is directly applicable to, I think, every business. Um, okay, cool. So um, I, I have a, a couple more questions. I, I, I'm just, as you've been going, I've been taking some some notes. You mentioned a lot about the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's something that I always have this connotation for Chamber of Commerce is that it's like they're kind of a joke. Like it's like, oh, the people who aren't legitimate businesses go there because they can't actually figure out how to become a legitimate business. And that's, you know, 100% probably my story or what I've seen about them. Um, so I'd love to know more about that because I think that's something that maybe a lot of people don't ever think about tapping into. So what's been your experience there? Um, what have you found and how have you found it useful? I, I wish someone who taught me how to network like 15, 10 years ago, because, you know, like a lot of people, when they go to Chamber Mixer, right, you know, before COVID, assuming that it's in person, then you want to pass out a lot of business cards. And your goal is to collect as many business cards as possible. Next day, you spend them or you put them on your newsletter, and that'll be it. So I did that for a while. And then, you know, before, and then someone taught me uh, a way, instead of asking them to find out more about you, like we just talk find out more about them. You know, ask them, people like to talk about themselves, especially people love to talk <laughs> about their business. You know, if I ask anyone about the business at uh, networking, they could talk forever, right? So I get them to open up and your goal when you go to a networking meeting is not to, it, it's not quantity, it's the quality of the contact. You know, you gotta prepare yourself too. When I go into networking, uh, who will be my ideal client? Or, you know, like I was saying before, who will be a potential power partner that you guys can both go after a big job? Then you look for those partners. Maybe at, you know, the first time you don't meet your ideal client, second time you don't meet your ideal client. But then you want to be known in the group, or especially if you're in a chamber, that you are the person doing what you do. So depending on what chamber that you're in, uh, obviously, you know, go to a lot of different one of them, see which one is right for you. If people mention about promotional product, who would they think of right away? I hope, and you know, hopefully, with my time spent there, you know, I would be the person that they point out. So you might never know who they're in contact with. And also, when I network with a person, not only I want to know who they are as a person, and I will kind of guess on the back end who they will probably have contact with. You know, are they going to be people that I wanted to meet? Because, if, Bob, if I know you nice enough, I will probably know that you probably have connect with brand that in marketing, you probably work with some marketing manager, business owner. And if we have a good enough relationship, when the time is right, I asked you to make that introduction for me, then most likely you do that. And that's how I wanted to encourage everyone to develop when you network at the chamber. It's not about how many cards you have. It's about how many meaningful and quality relationships that you can have with the members at the chamber. And what advice would you give to someone who's maybe super introverted and like maybe even terrified of going to a, a meeting like that? And not like, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to quantify outside of terrified in the sense of not like COVID terrified, but like just the idea of talking right. to people in that context Hiding can be court, scary. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was me. I was hiding in the corner. I will hang by the bar, pretend I'm getting a drink, but then really afraid to talk to anyone. But I will encourage, especially a lot of the networking meeting right now on, on Zoom. And then your goal is to maybe make one small talk per meeting. That's your goal. You know, okay. if you're more outgoing, if you're getting warmed up and if you're getting, you know, comfortable with the format, make two connections. And then the more you do it, it's just like you practice, you know, a, a, a skills, the better you will get. You'll make one meaningful connection each time you network. 
And that could be your goal. And then continue to follow up. And please, please don't sell to them. Don't put them on like a spam. <laughs> you know, don't try to sell. You know, uh, I'll share, you know, something that I would do, you know, when I meet a new contact. The next day, I would just send them email, you know, nice meeting you. I'll tell them my contact. And then my pitch is always going to be, please tell me about a good ideal client for your business. I want to see within my connection if I can connect you. And if I can really connect them with that person, I'll do so. So by doing that, you're reaching them out to build goodwill. And then it's, at the same time, I'll check out their website. I'll probably follow them on social media. And then I'll actually you know, pay attention with who they are, what they're up to for like at least 30 days. So within 30 days, if I know that they might be a good client or potential client of me, then I'll ask and comment of, you know, I like what you're doing with your post on LinkedIn and I like how your Instagram feeds are showcasing your product. Then that showed to them I'm paying attention and I'm mm. hearing what they're trying to do because people like the engagement. People want to feel and like when someone comment them what they're trying to do in the marketing strategy. So uh, is it okay for us to schedule a phone call? Then it goes on, and if it they turn in becomes something that I need, then we move on to uh, my sales funnel. But don't sell them, you know, the next day, and try to be helpful and try to be a resource uh, that people reach out to. Hundred percent, yeah. It's funny. I know uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be at a speaking event, and you know I, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, do it. And then as part of being a speaker, they added me to their marketing email list. I was like, wait a second, hang on, that's not what I signed up for. I, I didn't give you my email address for that purpose. And I think what you're talking about is the same thing, like right, like you hand out a business card. I don't have to get spammed all of a sudden. And if I do, it just feels like everybody else. So you want to stand out and be a little bit different. Um, I want to ask you this. So you, you're going and you said, hey, I'm going to follow these people for 30 days so that, you know, that they know that you're paying attention to what they're doing. How do you not get overwhelmed with all the connections that you're making and people you're talking to in that capacity? If you're going to be like, I could see that stacking up over time to be, you know, it could be a lot of people you're trying to, to stay in touch with. It's true, but not a lot of people post every day. You know, a lot of not a lot of people are, you know, actively and then you know, I, I have a certain criteria that I look for, you know, obviously for, for my business. So if I know that they are not for me, then I will not pay more attention than if I know that, you know, these are the probably ideal client that I can work with. Or right. so uh, there's like a filter and you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to give more time to those who are more likely to convert into customers. Like a, like, like a sales funnel. So I will filter them down. You know, I know what client that are good for me, you know, as a business then I'll know that these are the ones that I want to pay more attention to. These are the ones I probably can network with, or maybe I'll send them as, you know, you can do that easily with your uh, CRM software. They, they, these are, maybe these are good partners that I sometimes can uh, send, uh, you know, my clients to. And these are the expert of this kind of few. Uh, and I developed sometime, you know, especially with COVID in the beginning, everything shut down, right? So mm -hmm. I, develop a relationship with, I would call them my board of advisor kind of. So whenever I need a uh, legal question, accounting question, uh, sometimes marketing question, I know who I can reach out to that will give me a solid answer right away. You know, imagine you develop all this uh, contacts that you have. So basically whatever that you want advice on, you know that there's someone you can rely on. That's perfect. That's perfect. And so I, I love, I, if I can say, there seems to be a theme for you in your business, which is, hey, you know, I'm, I'm relying on expert advice. And I, I want to highlight the expert part of that advice and support from people. And I think that's a huge capacity. And I think, um, at least from my own personal experience, I can say that the businesses that that tap into experts whenever they need help and whenever they need support tend to be more successful. Uh, at least that's that's my opinion. Do you, do you have you found the same thing? Obviously, both from your experience and from others other businesses that you've connected with. Yeah, for especially for networking, you know, wearing my sales hat right now. You know, who do you really want to connect? Assuming that you know who you would like to connect, or a new uh, area that you want to branch out to for your business, then find out who in your contact base who already know all of them already. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, then you want to connect with that person. 
you know, you wanted to help them, you want to engage with them. So by the time that they trust you and you build uh, your relationship with them, then you can ask for a warm introduction, which is the best form of uh, reaching out to new prospect. And then that person already have all the people that you ever want to connect with. If you know, if he opens the door to introduce you to people that he know already, then you're already a step ahead. Then you know, I if I cold call them, if I just get a list and I call like a hundred calls, which I did when I first started the CDDVD business, I call like a hundred businesses cold a day. So the chances of success is not high. But then, uh, if it is a wrong referral and introduction. The chances of success that's a lot higher. You cold called a hundred businesses. That's a mate like a day. That's crazy. What 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 was that like? Like tell me about that experience. I, I've never really done full on cold calling, so I'm curious. Well, you warm up to it. You know, I I, I learned a lot of. You know, you have to be ready. People hang up on you. You know, people <laughs> angry with you. You have to accept that. And uh, I think uh, I learned how to warm up. So I call a couple of people that I know that. Will take my call anytime, so I kind of warm up with what I wanted to say, and then it's good if you write down what you want to say and why he contacted them. So after ten or twenty rejection, you get better, you know. And <laughs> when you get to a hundred, you're flying. You know, you know exactly what their objections are. How are you able to overcome those objections, and why should they talk to you in the first place? Right. It's like, yo, bring on those objections. I got this. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah, you know, this has been a great conversation. I love, I love your tenacity and your determination to build what you've built. I love that you've, you know, built something, sold it, and then are doing it again. Um, I think there's nothing more um, admirable than someone who is, is, is crazy enough to do it once and then crazy enough to do it again a second time. Maybe it's, maybe it's easier the second time, but um, I appreciate that. So uh, where can uh, people who want to connect with you find you on, on social or, or network with you, as you said? Yeah, I love networking. Do do reach out to me if you have any question or just want to collaborate. Um, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. So uh, just, you know, find me, Swai Ho. And if you want to Google me, uh, Google Swai Ho, hashtag the promo guy. And if you wanted to uh, learn more about business, uh, you can visit uh, Garuda Promo. It's G-A-R-U-D-A promo.com. Perfect. Perfect. And the guys, definitely check him out, connect with him, reach out. I think it's uh, someone who's uh, going to be a good person to connect with. As he's just said, it's, that's, you know, what he does. So appreciate your time, Swear, so much. Thank you for being here. For all of you guys listening or watching, appreciate your time as well. As always, we drop new episodes weekly. So thank you for being here and look forward to seeing you on another episode next time. You know the drill. I have one small favor to ask you. Please go out there and share this with a friend if you found value at least one friend, but more than one's always good too. Um, but yeah. And then also if you could leave a review, the reviews and ratings and all that stuff, it doesn't matter if it's on YouTube or, or Apple or Google or Spotify or wherever else, all that stuff helps get this show out there further. And the whole point of this show is to help as many people as we can. And so you helping us with that is a huge, huge, huge boost to that goal. So I thank you for doing it ahead of time. As always, we'll see you on another episode next week. Thanks so much. Take it easy. Bye.